by sun and candlelight. I love thee freely as men strive for right. I love thee purely as they turn from praise. I love thee with a passion put to use in my old griefs and with childhood's faith. I love thee with a love I seem to lose with my lost saints. I love thee with the breath, smiles, tears of all my life. And if God choose, I shall but love thee better after death. Right. So that's great. Uh, uh, the poem is not uh, very long, and it is mainly about love. Uh, can you just write in the chat box uh, how did you feel? Like uh, what what feeling did the poem give you? How did you feel about it? Okay, so how did you feel about the, the poem you just heard? What kind of feeling did it give you? Like, did you like it? You didn't like it. And why you like it or why you didn't like it? Can you just type down uh, how you felt about the poem? Or if you want to speak up, that would be fine too. You can just uh, type in the, yeah, it's calm, yeah. All right, that's good, Muhammad. Thank you. It makes you feel comfortable, yeah. Very good. Lareen, how did it feel? Jawad, yes, sir. Peaceful and calm, yes, absolutely. All right. All right, that's great. You are you are great critics. Thank you, Jawad. Uh, the poem was deep and beautiful. Yeah, peaceful. Absolutely. Thank you so much. Look at uh, the majority of the answers. It is peaceful. It gives you comfortable feeling because of the softness you can get from the uh, voices. The softness that you can get from the. Um, the words and and definitely you like the, the the feeling because of the choice of words all right class so what we heard now is called in the world of poetry it is called uh, the um, uh, a lyrical poem this is a lyrical poem these are the words how do i love thee let me count the ways I love thee to the depth and breadth and height. Look at the repetition of the words, depth and breadth and height. My soul can reach when feeling out of sight. For the ends of being and ideal grace, I love thee to the level of every days. Most quiet need by sun and candle light. I love thee freely as men strive for right. I love thee purely as they turn from paradise. I love with a passion put to use in my old griefs and with my chi childhood's faith. I love thee with a love I seemed to lose. With my lost saints, I love thee with the breath, smiles, tears of all my life. And if God choose, I shall but love thee better after death. So just look at the, the words, and if you count those uh, lines, you will see that these are 14 lines. This is one form of a famous type of poetry. This is what we call the uh, uh, lyrical type. So uh, also for you to know what we will be uh, having quizzes in and end of unit uh, test, it's, uh, we're gonna be uh, exploring some of the definitions, important definitions in uh, poetry. So um, to, uh, why would that be? Because the uh, end of unit test, you will be asked to analyze a poem. 
uh, it's not going to be a, a very tough task. I'll try to make it as uh, simple and as short as possible. However, you have to cover all the elements of finding out what, uh, uh, what we are going to test you in. So we'll have some terminologies, some, some <clears throat> uh, um, names for you important to understand what are they. And then we'll have a look at some examples for each type. And then uh, the end of uh, unit test, you will be, you will be uh, uh, analyzing a poem. So uh, the terminology you need to know if we say, what is a subject matter of a poem? Meaning, what is the poem about? So it is the idea or the thing that the poem talks about. So the poem I just played with you. Can you give me one title, one word? What is it about? If you can write in the chat box, what was the poem about? One word, only one word. Excellent, excellent, Jawad, the first one to write. Thank you. It is about love. OK. So when we talk about the subject matter, we just say the poem is about love. This is absolutely different from we trying to figure out what they say about love. When we, when we go deeper in love, then that will be the ideas talking about. What is it all about? So subject matter, you can get it from a repeated word or from the title, as simple as that. You can take down this as a note. This is a tip to help you how to figure out the subject matter of, of anything, not only poem, from the repeated words or from the title. Why do I say repeated words? Sometimes you do not have a title. Sometimes you read a, p a piece of writing and there is no title. So you don't really figure out what is it about. So in that case, you will see what is the repeated words talking about. Now, now let's move on to the theme of a, uh, of a poem. What is the theme? It is the message that the uh, uh, poet wants to communicate through the poem or any writer through the piece of writing. It is different from the main idea because definitely any main idea would have some details to explain it. So it's more of a subject matter, similar to subject matter, but let's say if we say love between a man and a woman, or love between a mother and her children, the poet's love to nature. So here is moving a little bit detailed, more than just word love. Now let's move about to talk about the structure of a poem. So, the structure of the poem is the number of lines, is the number of syllables in, in each line. If we say uh, the, the line has uh, two or three or four syllables, so that would be the, uh, the description of the structure of the poem. The rhyming, the ending words, remember uh, the depth, the breadth and, and depth. Look at these. These are rhyming. We'll talk about the music in the poem at a later point. So it is the arrangement of the lines, how the writer arranged or the poet arranged the lines. Did, did the writer arrange the lines in the shape of a circle or just regular writing? What did he write in the beginning? What did he write in the middle? What did he write in the end? And so on and so forth. Then we talk about the form of a poem. What is the form of a poem? How it looks? Uh, are there any stanzas or is it only one stanza? Uh, is it 14 lines? Is it one line, two lines, three lines? What type of a poem is it, all right? And uh, we'll talk about the types of poems because any of these could come for you in a question, like uh, what is a form of a poem? And then you need to put the explanation, okay? Now, the haiku is a famous uh, Japanese style of writing poetry. It's really very easy, and that is going to be your homework. You will be writing a haiku uh, uh, of your mind. You do not uh, have to go um, read something on the internet or uh, uh, search for Google, anything, nothing. It's you 
going to write it as homework. It's for you. Look at how easy it is. This is a form of Japanese poetry, and it's only three lines. Imagine you will be writing only three lines. Uh, and, and the first and the uh, uh, third line have five syllables. Like, let's, let's, let's count it this way, five words, okay? Whereas the second has seven. We'll figure it out how to do it when I show you an example for that. So just bear in mind, the haiku is going to be one of your uh, assignment, uh, I mean, uh, quizzes that you will do by the end of the first session. Now, the free verse is another one. Again, you will be writing one free verse. The free verse, just like regular talk. As simple as that. You can have a rhyme or you can not have a rhyme. If you say, for example, I feel like the shining star today. Believe it or not, this is free verse. And you, I am 100% sure you can write a, a free verse like that. So this is another task you will be doing, creating this out of your own. You are not going, I don't want you even to look at examples on Google. This is some, something easy, you can do it even while you are sitting now. Uh, you can have stanzas or lines. See, when I say stanzas is similar to the um, paragraphs that you can see in a piece of reading. Stanzas is the alternative word for verse or poetry. What, the, what does the poet want to say? If, for example, you write free verse, like three lines or two lines, uh, beginning, you talk about the early morning, what did you do? Three lines in the afternoon, what did you do? What happened? And so on. One line to, the, uh, to end this uh, free verse. You can do that, or you can write one line. It's up to you. So this is, see, it's really nice. I just want you to uh, taste the poetry and like it, okay? Now, let's move to the sonnet. Uh, usually a sonnet is of 14 lines. This is the one we just started our session with. It was a sonnet, 14 line poem, poem with a rhyme scheme. And of course, uh, the first time it appeared, it appeared in Italy. And of course, Amina Kulina Shakespeare just uh, did it uh, in a wonderful way. And uh, he created amazing sonnets and uh, poems and plays and so on. So again, uh, this is not going to be your homework because it's kind of a little bit uh, like, you know, uh, take time. The other ones is very easy, very simple. That's why that's going to be your homework. Uh, this one is just for you to enjoy and to uh, um, figure out the beauty of it because it must have a rhyme scheme. There must be music and there must be good choice of words. Now let's move to the lyric. What is a lyric? So a lyric is a formal type of poetry, very formal. It expresses personal emotions or feelings. It is typically spoken in the first person. You will see that the poet is talking about something using his first, I see this and that, I enjoy this and that, or we as a family lo look at so and so. And there must be kind of a narrative. There is a story, like, for example, a poet uh, explains or tells us the story of him uh, watching the rain for the first time while he was uh, following his sheep in the meadows, the green meadows. So they give you uh, lots of details, narrative, description, story, and there is a, an element of drama in it, dramatic, narrative, and lyrical. And it is also um, uh, good, good to follow because it is somehow similar to a story. The elegy is, uh, uh, it doesn't have rules. Uh, so it's kind of, you know, uh, you can talk about one subject uh, like death. They are usually written about a loved one who has passed away. Somehow, I don't want to say kaiba, I don't want to say melancholic, but somehow it is about something that is not so lively and it is not like, you know, a happy thing. But however, uh, it often ends in a hopeful tone. Like if you talk about death, and you and you say the death and this and the gloomy feeling and this and that and all this kind of thing. However, 
they end usually saying that this is the norm of life. This is the very much expected out of life. Every living thing must die one day. So what is this? It's somehow uh, not so cheerful, not so happy. However, there is always hopeful note. Why is it hopeful when you are talking about death? It is hopeful because we tell you that this is a true fact of life. So you don't have to worry. You don't have to take it uh, in, in, uh, in a bad mood. It is just about a fact of life. The ballad is personally my best. So to be honest, the ballad is an old and traditional form of poetry. It tells about a dramatic or emotional story, and it is of mainly four lines, not too long, and it has rhyme. Usually it talks about, you know, when you love your country, when you talk about your um, uh, one of your principles, if you are talking about your religion, if you're talking about something that is even it's called the ballad, right? If you um, if you know the Arabic word, the ballad, which is your country. So somehow people are attached to their countries. Now, I'm going to give you some examples of the haiku, how to look at it. Just read read some examples here. The haiku, remember, the haiku is a Japanese uh, simple uh, poem, three lines, a very simple one. An old silent pond, a frog jumps into the pond. Splash, silence again. As simple as that, you can write about anything. Maybe if you have an, a, a pet, if you have a cat, or if you have a dog. If you have a fish, golden fish, anything, you can write about it. Or if you have something that you really like, like, like your mobile, you can write me something about your mobile. Or you can write something about your, um, you know, um, uh, some, something you like, uh, a sandwich you like, or uh, a scene, a certain uh, bottle you like, um, laptop, anything. I would accept it because it's, as you can see, very simple. This is for your homework. That's why I'm focusing on this. I'm giving you examples to show you. So this is an example of uh, uh, look at the words and all the silent pond. A frog jumps into the pond. Like one, two, three, four, five. Uh, a frog is, is, is considered the one syllable. So five syllables in here. An old silent pond. Look at the syllables. An old silent pond. You can, you can count this way. So you can say it uh, uh, four words with an article and then five syllables and then two or three syllables again. Splash, silence again. Okay, so as simple as that. Uh, and this is the uh, highlight, uh, sorry, this is the lighting one candle. Again, a haiku poem, uh, the light of a candle transferred to another candle spring twilight as simple as this now let me ask you what is the poet want to tell you here and and i want you please to write down in the chat box what is the poet wants to tell you i'm gonna i'm gonna uh, write it in the chat box for you to figure it out i can give you some time to think it over. Can I put you in breakout rooms class? Can I put you in breakout rooms and discuss it together? Are you okay? To be honest, would like to have the peer education too. Okay? So, uh, so I just, uh, I wrote you down here and I, I can create two breakout rooms. Every two of you would uh, think it uh, over. Talk about it. Please take the words. I put them here in the chat. The light of a candle is transferred to another candle. A spring twilight. I'm going to put you in. Uh, do we have breakout rooms here, Mr. Uh, Hussein? Uh, Why yes. Zoom? Do we yes. have? Yes. Uh, yeah. I see reactions. Where is the breakout rooms? I see recording. The ballad. Uh, 
the, the example of a ballad, and we talked about the ballad, that it is like a long story uh, where it usually refers to a principle or an idea that the writer cares for. He puts it in the form of a story, and you can always look at the wonderful Oscar Wilde in his um, presentations. I'm going to show you um, the... Um, uh, the, the Oscar Wilde uh, poem. Uh, it's going to be like a little bit longer one. So we don't want to, uh, you know, take a long time in it. But uh, let me let me put it on Google Chrome because I have Edge here. Edge is not always reliable with the Zoom. So I'm going to put it here. And I'm going to share it for you uh, just to have a look at. You can read it at your own pace, because I can tell that in the class we do have some talents. And I and I'm sure that many of you are really interested in poetry, which is great. So this is the ballad of reading Gaul. This is by Oscar Wilde. As you can see, it's a very long, not very, but again, it's a story. Remember, the ballad is a story. Uh, it's a good opportunity for me to show you that uh, stanzas are uh, similar to the um, uh, paragraphs in the prose writing. And it is divided here as a section I, so section first, and the section second one, second one, and the third one. It's as if like act one, act two in a play, or chapter one, chapter two in a novel. So it's very similar, as you can see, with the uh, rhyming words. And you can see it's always rhymed here. Uh, high, sky, air, die, hard, walked. So you can see it's always rhymed and it's formed of stanzas, uh, about five uh, lines each. You can read it for your own pleasure because it's like a, a long one and of course has lots of um, ideas in. Oscar Wilde is a great uh, author. You can enjoy his writings at your uh, pace. Uh, for now, again, I'll be more focused on, uh, usually when I teach, I teach for pleasure, not only for passing exams and getting grades and so, but also I want you to enjoy what you are learning and enjoy whatever uh, uh, material we are presenting. So just to refer you to this, you can read it at any uh, point of your uh, time. I'm gonna uh, close this one. And I'm going to uh, share another interesting, very interesting type of um, poetry. Uh, I'm not going to have it as assignment, but again, it's up to you. It could be like um, a quiz or so, but it is up to you to, uh, to enjoy and you like it. This is what we call the shape poem. Anybody familiar with the shape poem? You can just raise your hand if you are familiar, you know it, uh, if you get an idea about it. Okay, so uh, the shape poem is a poem that has the shape of the topic we are talking about. So as you look here, the star is, uh, is a poem uh, where you, uh, can, as you can see, the poet wrote the words based on the shape of a star. Because the poem titled as the star, you can see the writing taking the shape of a star. Oh, pretty star, shine and sparkle above us in the sky, glow and the twinkle. Moon and the star adores each other, shines at night and make the sky look bright. Be my guiding light, never fade little star, always a twinkle like a dot of a magic. All the night a twinkle like a guiding light for us, a heavenly body filled with luster. See how joyful this kind of poetry. It is joyful, simple, mainly for entertainment reasons. 
mean unless of course the shape has a certain like for example if a poet decides to write about mental uh, disorder so the, the the poet probably would take the shape of a brain and starts forming his or her words based on the shape of a brain so but usually it is it is for uh, enlightenment for joy for happiness and as you can see very simple words similar to the famous song for children twinkle twinkle little star remember this one so as you can see even the words are very similar to that kind of thing so uh, this is how you put it in the form you of course i'll, I'll show you how to create one you can have it as an uh, a quiz or so uh, if you know if we wanted to uh, get high marks like more marks grades we can add this as a, a quiz for you to uh, to use because it's very easy very simple you know i'm going to start with you with uh, simple easy quizzes because i want you to get higher marks especially in the uh, beginning of the unit now this is another one in a twist Look at the shape. What is the shape of this uh, uh, poem? Write down in the chat box, please. Let me see what you think. The shape of this, look at the in a twist. And look at the shape here. What is this shape? Can you write down in the chat box for everyone to see, please? What is the shape of the poem here, the twist? Or what do you expect is it going to be about? Write down, please, in the chat box. Anyone? Tornado. Absolutely. Yes, Joad. Thank you. It is about a, a, a tornado or a, about a twist or something. And, and the guy, instead of saying tornado, he or she just wrote the word uh, uh, in a twist. We felt the rain, wind, and hail, and then the thunder and lightning came. The wind gathered up and began to spin, like a spinning top, sucking up dust like a vacuum cleaner. The twister went around and around like a merry-go-round. The gusts of air were picking up dust. It continued to roar loudly, destroying everything along the way. Soon it was gone. I absolutely liked this poem. It is so directly going to the mind and hearts because it, it, it is simply uh, describing what happens in the tornado in a simple words. You don't feel scared and you don't feel hideous. It's simple, easy, and there is hope. Soon it was gone. So the, the, the disturbance or the, the moment of uh, not being normal, sunny, shiny, whether it's a tornado where everything is happening and it takes this form. It's a very famous poem. It's really easy and simple. And the creativity of the poets here that they used even rhymes. Look at the rhythm and the rhyme. Rain, wind and hail and lighting came, spin, like a vacuum cleaner, which is very modern word, like merry-go-round, round and round, like a merry-go-round. And in our next class, we will see how to use those uh, repeated sounds to create music, to create wonderful feeling to the uh, ears listening to your poems. 
to be honest, I like poetry, and, and poetry is 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 amazing section of art, and uh, it's not easy for everyone to understand unless you look at it with an open eye. And this is what I want you to just look at it at open eye, and I'm not gonna give you hard tasks at all because I want you to appreciate it and like it, just to feel the beauty of joining the words in a simple, natural way. I don't think that the author uh, like was um, you know suffering or getting much time thinking where to get the words from any of that. So as you can see, very simple, very easy. The poem here is shaped as the thing it described. The shape adds to the meaning. So uh, imagine that the writer wrote those words in a regular form. You would still understand, but it it. Uh, the the shape uh, uh, poet, poem here gives it meaning. It, it it makes it more wonderful and it makes it like more um, joining in the eye. Here is another version where you can use the uh, shape poems uh, in an, a different way. Uh, this is somehow um, you are addressing the visual learners. I'm not going to say for uh, younger uh, audience or younger listeners. But again, you know that we have different learning abilities and learning styles. Uh, the majority of the people, uh, like adults, younger people, any person, the learning abilities, the majority of the people, about 90% of the people are visual, meaning you, you understand things using your eyes. As you can hear, uh, see, my name is Ciara Circle. I am nice and round. There is not a corner on me to be found. Look at the rhyme. Look at the beauty of choosing the words in a very simple lines reflecting the circle. And the writer here not only puts it in this way, just like the shape and that's it, but also they had a colorful shape with a, a twist of drawing, I absolutely allow you to do that to um, give a grade for creativity. I would definitely love to see your work, whatever work you would produce in a shape poem, that would be great. So absolutely, you can do that in any uh, design you want. This is a triangle, look at that. Tehran triangle, this is me, count my sides, one, two, three. Just look at that, as simple as that, very easy, uh, pleasing, and you can do whatever you want in here. Now, this is a, a, a square, Sammy Square is my name, trace my sides, they are all the same. Just look at that. So I'm going to leave it to you to be creative and do whatever you uh, can think of. I'm, I'm giving you, um, you know, uh, a simple uh, average tasks to get you high grades, especially at the beginning of the, um, the course. Now, how to write a shape poem? And that would be given to you on the Google Docs to remind you how to create the shape poem you are going to uh, think of any inspiration. Like you want to write about your mug, your favorite mug. You want to write about your favorite mobile. You want to write about a book you like. You want to write about something in the heart, some, something related to uh, feelings, uh, appreciation to your mom, uh, love to your, uh, a, a, um, a plant, a, a bird, whatever you can think of, you can have it in the form of a shape, get inspiration from it. Then uh, you already, I, I shared with you some examples of shape poetry. Now you decide what is it going to be about. If it is, uh, you're gonna take the shape of heart, then what are you going to write about? Is it about your love to mom? You're about uh, love to your uh, uh, God, whatever, whatever thing you can uh, come up with. And then you pick the shape you uh, want to have, and then you outline the form for your poetry. What do you want to have? And then you start writing your poem. And then of course, uh, brainstorm for getting the words, all the words you can get. If you want to have some kind of an element of music, then try to 
figure out words that rhyme, like around, surround, like uh, love, stuff, like, you know, uh, care, share, any of those, like you can think of, just to prepare them, put them together, and then you start rhyming your words and start writing your own words. Uh, read the shape of the poem for inspiration, and then uh, you decide, uh, you pick them, uh, uh, put them in an outline for your form and your poem, and then you start writing as simple as that. You fill in the shape of the text. You can uh, definitely, uh, um, you know, try it first with a pencil and paper. If you can do it on uh, the computer, that would be fine. If not, then probably you can uh, put it on uh, paper and you scan it. And uh, for me to, to, to see, that would be great. So that would be uh, an amazing opportunity for you to, uh, to know, to kind of uh, uh, improve your writing skills and uh, a way for getting grades. Uh, now we, we, we're close to uh, 12 o'clock. I would prefer that you have a lunch break. Let's take it now and come back. Uh, now it is 12, almost 12. So come back at 12.20. Uh, Go eat something and come back at 12.20. Okay, so uh, this section we will be talking about uh, the um, glossary of metaphors uh, that you will uh, need to understand the poem uh, as part of your um, task and assignment in this course is to analyze a poem that will be uh, our uh, next class but for now it's important for you to get yourself uh, familiarized with the uh, terminology and the glossary of poetry that we use in poetry. So this is uh, related to the shape of the poem, to the structure of the poem and how to write it, what the, how many lines and so on. We agreed that the stanza is the amount of the lines that grouped together. We spoke that the stanza is similar to uh, a paragraph in the prose. Uh, it could be of two lines, a couplet or a tercet, three lines or four lines or five lines, six lines and so on. And we have the meter, which is the pattern, the syllabus. It's like, listen to the beats here. Uh, so this beat is what we call the uh, rhythm of the uh, poem, and that is caused by the syllables. The syllables could be one single word or a, a, br a broken sound or unbroken sound spoken. Like when you say in the, in the, which is in the. So it's two words, but could be, uh, if I say in the sky, in the sky, it could be as one syllable. So it is not a count of words, but it is a count of a syllable. And as uh, I just showed you, it's kind of rhythm, music, like drum rhythms that you have. Those of you who listen to music, you would be able to understand what do we mean exactly by the syllables and the uh, rhythm. Uh, so let's talk about the sound devices. It's really important to take care of your devices in uh, a poetry because this is what makes poetry different from prose or the, the other kind of uh, uh, writing. The music that you can get out of the poem is what makes it uh, interesting, what makes it effective. And uh, this is part, a really important part that you need to include when you are analyzing a poem. As a task, you will be asked, to, required to analyze a poem. So you need to know what are the sound devices and how to figure them out and also know the effect of them, why the poets use them. So uh, the poets use patterns of deliberate repetition in the poem to give sound effects. So these are used to emphasize the meaning. So the importance of having sound effects uh, is to emphasize the meaning or the feeling. If I want you to feel 
annoyed. I'm going to use certain words to make you feel annoyed. If I want to make you feel happy and hilarious, I'm going to choose certain words with certain sounds to cause this feeling. So it's either to uh, clarify or emphasize the meaning or the feeling, and also they are used to show you the tone of the speaker. Remember, you can have a question in the uh, tests to ask you what is the purpose of using sound devices. So obviously three purposes, to emphasize the meaning, the feeling, and to clarify the tone of the speaker. If the speaker or the writer or the poet wants to draw your attention to a certain point, so what is the words, the sounds he is or he or she is using? These are some examples of the sound effects in the poem that you will uh, be required to identify, like the rhyme. It is the identical sound at the end of the lines. Remember the opening of today's poem ended in a certain sound, certain uh, uh, words, the, the end to give you this feeling. Look at that, the cat and the hat sat on a mat. Look at the at, at, at. So this is the rhyme. The rhythm is the repetition of number of beats in nearby li uh, lines, like uh, look at that, the cat, the hat, sat on a mat. So this is what we call the rhythm. It's like the drum. Those of you who play music or appreciate music, you will understand it's like ta-ta-ta, ta-ta-ta, uh, something related to the sound and the uh, uh, description of the line. The alliteration, it's a repetition of a consonant sounds in lines. The, the consonants, of course, you know, uh, all the letters, uh, we have five vowels and the remaining are sounds, the constant sounds. They are not moving. It's like the B sound. It's like the F sound, any other sound. Like, look at that, burning bright. What is repeated here? The B, B. I'm not talking about letters here. I'm talking about the sound, the sound of the constant letter, the B. Letter has a sound, it's B, B. Or here you can say the frame, thy fearful sympathy. Frame, fearful. By William Blake from Tiger, Tiger is a, a great poem that I recommend that you read it on your free time. It's really, really amazing. And the assonance, it's the repetition of the vowel. So if I'm repeating the alliteration here, which is the sounds, the consonant sound, we have a similar thing, which is the repetition of the vowel sounds. Look at the words here. Uh, in a garden with its sleeping and deep, cool murmur. Look at the e, e, o. These are the sounds of the, uh, cons uh, the vowels. Like he, he gives his harness, bell, shack, or so you can see the e, ah, e, ah. Okay, so you can see the music here. It's uh, like a zigzag, e, ah, e, ah. Okay, so this is a sound that you can figure out from the poet's choice of words. And they all should be in a neighboring area, in one line can see it in one line, uh, like, uh, vert uh, like horizontal. The vertical, which is the ending of the lines, it's the, the rhyme. The rhyme is ending, the rhythm is inside the line. The ephony, it's again combination of pleasant sounds because the writer has an aim. The writer wants you to be excited. So he or she going to choose certain sounds that cause that kind of happiness. Like in Shakespeare's sonata, when he says, so long as men can breathe or eyes can see, so long lives this and this gives life to thee. It's all about rebirth and being born 
and the energy of life. So the writer chooses the words that cause a pleasant effect. Exactly the opposite is in uh, cacophony. When the, uh, the writer wants to give you the harsh feeling of unpleasant sounds. So they give you, for example, here, if there is a tree that you may hear the leaves blowing and it's raining and you may hear the rain on the sidewalk, you may, you may hear a street musician playing music. All of these sights and sounds happen at once, creating a, a, a cacophony and a mixture of sounds that do not quite fit together. Like the rain, they give you the feeling of a rain and the broken trees and the wind blowing. And this is like probably not giving a, a pleasant effect. So the uh, writer chooses certain words to give you the exact feel. Onomatopoeia is a great device. We used to teach it to even children at school to be able to use the words that are created from the sound of a something. Like if I say a snake, what is the sound of a snake? It hisses. So I use the word hisses. Like if I ask you, what is the sound of a water when it is dropped? So you're gonna say it's splash. So look at the word splash. And then you use the word splash, splashy, splash. So you are using the sound of the thing in your words to create that wonderful effect of the sound music. It's like the choo-choo. This is the sound of what? It's the sound of the train. And hiss, the sound of a snake. And buzz. <laughs> It's the sound of a bell or something. So you use these words, or the writer uses these words to give uh, onomatopoeia the sound of the poem. If you, uh, in a poem, a great poem, uh, Edgar Allan, it's about the bells. So they, they say how they clang and clash and roar. Look at the word roar, clash, and clang. It's like clang and clash and roar. So this is kind of a nomotopia. You figure it out in the poem and you, 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 uh, when you're analyzing it, you would certainly mention that this is uh, a nomotopia to create a sound and effect on the audience. Now let's talk about the content, which is really, really important. The content is how the poet puts his words, and instead of just regular words, just regular lines, you will be uh, using uh, devices, what we call metaphoric devices. The metaphoric devices are really important to create a pleasant effect, and they are there to make you uh, understand the poet more, and they make you uh, understand the message the poet wants to tell you. And also you can judge the effect of uh, uh, the style of the poet, how he writes. Is he using strong devices because uh, the device matches the message the writer wants to convey? If you are talking about a stolen land, what kind of metaphor is the writer using? If I say, for example, the land is crying for uh, its uh, uh, children dying on her lap. If I describe the, the land as a mother who is weeping and crying because, because her children die in her lap, the lap here is the soil of the land. So this is a kind of metaphor. I want to ask you, which is more stronger? If I use this image showing you that the land is crying for her children dying in her lap, or if I just say, uh, today the country lost a big number of its citizens dying on the land. 
which is more effective, which is more touchy, which is more stronger in conveying the message. Definitely using uh, devices that make the message stronger is much powerful. And of course, will make you more uh, understanding and more attached to uh, the message. Now, the first, uh, met the first devices we use is what we call a metaphor. A metaphor is when you compare two things that state one thing in another in order to help explain the idea and show hidden similarities. Here, I do not use any words to indicate that I am resembling object A to object B. Just like the example I gave you, the land is crying for her children or for the children and dying in her lap. I didn't say the land is like a mother, okay? So I don't use any devices here. I just use the metaphor. Life, here are some examples. When I say life is a highway. When I say her eyes were diamonds. When I say he is a shining star. The snow is a white blanket. She is an early bird. So I am not using any devices to show the similarities, but I give you the feeling that I compare life to a highway. I compare the, the girl's eyes to the diamonds because they are beautiful and they are shining. I compare the wonderful, smart young man to a shining star because he is a smart and brilliant as a star. I compare the snow to a white blanket. I never said it's like, you know what I mean? I compare the bird, the, uh, the girl who is always come to class early, like an early bird. She always in class before everybody else. She's always in class to uh, pay attention. She's always in class to uh, prove herself. So I just uh, compare her to an early bird because we know that the early bird always wake up in the morning and they catch the worm and they catch the food for their uh, little birds or the uh, small birds and they come back so early. They are the winners, right? So what do I want to tell you here about this wonderful girl? I want to say that she is always a winner. She is always a person who achieves her goals because she's always hardworking and early to do whatever she wants to do. All of these meanings are just given to you without further ado, without explanation, without talking, without using any devices. Now, similarly to this, I use what, something that we call a simile. A simile is uh, a device that uh, also poets use to compare two things together. But here, they use joining words. What are these joining words? Similarly, they can use the word like, as if, as, or any other word uh, resembling, for example. You can uh, think of any other word to show that they are joining two things together. Like if I say uh, the, the brave uh, boy was walking in the school resembling a soldier. So here the word resembling is like, like, or as if, or as, or such an, such a brave, uh, similar to any other uh, indication that the poet is using something else to use to show the uh, uh, comparison. Here you, you have uh, as busy as a bee. So here I want to say, ah, I am these days, I am as busy as a bee. So you understand that I am so working hard and all the time, I don't have free time, just like a bee. 
So where is the word here that the author use is the word as. Let me highlight it here. So this is as. As innocent as a lamb. Here again, another example is as. Or you can say as innocent resembling a lamb or as innocent such as a lamb. Any of the words that refer to uh, uh, a word that I use to, to compare two things. He runs like a cheetah. So I want to compare the boy's fast running just like the fast running of a cheetah. She worked as if, here is as if, as uh, the, the writer use it to show the simile. She walked as if she wore, she wear a peacock. What do I want to tell you here? Is she like a modest person or a snob or somebody who's too proud? Like we always know that the peacock is a symbol of snob, okay? Or a symbol of somebody who is like so proud of themselves. Her mouth is like a machine gun. What does the writer want to say here? Can anybody, I just want to, to see if you're following up. Her mouth is like a machine gun. Can you write down in, in the chat what the writer wants to say? Her mouth is like a machine gun. What, 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 is, what is the thing that we want to compare the, the mouth of this woman to a machine gun? Just write one word, what, what, what he wants to tell us. Is she kind? Is she a good person? Is she strong? Is she violent? Is she fierce? Is she stupid? Is she, what, what, what do you think? Just please write down in the chat box, what do you think? Just want to make sure you are following up and you are here in the class, paying attention and everything is fine, easy, easy to follow to you. Plus, are you here? Just what do you think the guy wants to tell you when her mouth is like a machine gun? Is she nice, kind? You can just uh, write uh, evil or you can write not kind or you can write violent. Loud. Oh, bravo, yes, sir. Yes, absolutely. Yes, bravo, yes, sir. Thank you. By the way, I'm going to give you uh, grades for uh, participation. By the way, it's, it's really important. Uh, I just want to make sure you are following up and paying attention. She's rude. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Could be loud. I, I, I'm, I'm really happy of your interpretations, evil, yes, yes. See, we, we can have inter different interpretations. All of them are correct. It's all how you feel, how you received the simile. What is the effect of the simile? She's hurt, she's hurting everyone. Yeah, absolutely, Jawad, yes. She's like a machine gun. She can hurt anyone by her words. She is not compassionate. She's not nice. She is evil. She's rude. She's loud. Absolutely. But you can also say if, if uh, maybe she is a person who is defending her lost land. Like what is happening in Palestine? Like what is happening in, in many other parts of the world? Uh, in Ukraine, when, when their country is being taken out of and somebody is talking about uh, protecting their land and she comes and she speaks in, in a strong voice and everybody says, oh, her mouth is like a machine gun. 
So yes, it could be like in a negative uh, effect or it could be in, uh, in a, a very positive effect. Like, yeah, she used her strong, loud, evil, rude, hurting ability voice to protect her land. So in here, we can say, as you will see later on, writers can use this to create a positive feeling out of it. So thank you so much for participating because um, it makes me, you know, understand your level of understanding and I feel more comfortable if you uh, uh, contribute with me. That is really great. Thank you. So as go as cold as ice here is very obvious. I think you can see that it's very uh, clear and how to interpret is what makes the big difference. Now personification. If the example I gave you in the beginning when we were talking about the land was crying for her children dying in her lap. What did I do now? I gave the attributes of a human being or of a mother to the land. So I gave, uh, this is a poetic device I used with you to give the animal or plant or any object uh, some character traits of a human qualities. Like my alarm clock yells at me to get up of bed every morning as if the alarm clock is saying, asking you, uh, Muhammad, wake up. Uh, um, you guys stand up and it's like you give it a quality of a human being to alarm clock. Time crept in the shadows like a thief. I'm now uh, giving the thief qualities, which is a, a person can be a thief, just give it to time. Lighting danced across the sky. Does the light dance? Of course not. Who dances? people dance. So again, I use it as a personification. So look at the term, it is called personification. Now let's move on. Here we have another one. Rita heard the last piece of uh, cake or pie calling her name. <laughs> and we always use this even in our uh, culture, Arabic culture, Middle East culture, we say, yeah, I couldn't resist the sandwich was calling me or the sandwich or the, the piece of cake was uh, asking my name. So it's a, it's a kind of personification. It's a very strong, um, like, you know, a strong uh, poetical advice, a device or uh, strong literary uh, style to use, and we can use it even in uh, prose. The paradox is a figure of a speech that uh, is a seemingly contradictory phrase, uh, phrase. You can just look at it in, in, in on the surface. It's something, ah, it looks bad, but when you go deeper, you know it's something good. Like if you say here, uh, because the writer here wants to give a certain truth or you want to give something like, you know, uh, in, in a strong uh, way. Like if you say uh, the pen is mightier than the sword. And this is not true in, rea in, in surface, in reality. If I have in my hand a pen and the other hand a sword, which is stronger? like the sword, but the way you used the pen could be more effective in hurting people <clears throat> than the sword. So on the surface, it, it looks like a contradictory. However, in reality, it is like good. Like if you say she, uh, she never tells her brother you are good, your homework is good. If, if there is a sister, a bigger sister, older sister, who's helping her younger brother to do their homework, for example, and she uh, is never telling him, you are great, bravo, good, and all of that, but she's always giving him uh, like, you know, uh, do this again, this is not done well, uh, repeat this one, and at the end, the writer tells you she was of real support 
And he never gives you the feeling that she's kind to the brother. But when you read the whole line, you understand that her being harsh on her brother was for his good. You know what I mean? So you can see it in this way, something on the surface that doesn't look uh, as it really is. And the irony, of course, the irony is, is a very famous device. And I personally love to use it quite often, whether it is in, uh, in uh, poetry or in uh, just a regular writing. Uh, you can always uh, use it in a simple way. You just uh, talk about something nice, uh, but in reality, you mean it's not nice. So it's a literary device in which contradictory statements or situations reveal a reality that is different from what appears to be true. I'll give you a very simple example. If you say you went to Walmart, you want to buy something, you used to buy it for $5, anything, okay? You used to buy it for uh, $5. And when you uh, come for one day, you find it, it's $9.99 as usual. It's almost double. So what you say, you smile at one side and you say, ah, very cheap, very cheap indeed. So is it cheap? Of course, it is not cheap. But what you say, you use irony to, uh, to express how you feel. We have an example here. Uh, telling a quiet group, okay, don't speak at all. So, well, they are not speaking in reality, right? They are not speaking, they are not responding, they are not, they are very quiet, especially when I was a teacher, like I was teaching in Dubai, and I had maybe a few times a teacher, uh, sorry, a class who's like, you know, shy, very shy, or very quiet. And if I wanted to use irony to joke around with them, and I would say, okay, okay, be quiet, don't speak, don't make noise. Whereas in reality, they do not speak. Actually, they are very silent. So this is a way, a funny way, not, not rude, not harshing, not offending, but it is kind of irony. We can use it in verbal irony. You just use it verbally when you uh, speak those words. Or when you, for example, coming home to a big mess, especially moms, the parents, uh, when they come home and they see your room is like, oh my God, it's like upside down. So your mom kindly says what? Uh, it's a great to be back or uh, what a wonderful room. And your mom might say, ah, I like your room. How tidy, how tidy is your room? Where in reality it is not tidy. So this is like a verbal irony. You say it with your mouth. Uh, or if you are telling, telling a, a rude customer, uh, okay, thank you, have a nice day, right? So when you say have a nice day and you, you say it in a, a certain tone to make the other person uh, realize that they were not so nice and you say it, have a nice day. And this is a kind of verbal irony. You want to be polite and you don't want to, to be harsh. Uh, but at the same time, you want to show the other person that you were not acting in the best way ever. I am not so happy of what you did. So you use it in this subtle way. Or when you are walking into an empty theater uh, and asking, uh, it's too crowded. Like if you are having a party and everybody is supposed to come, but nobody showed up. And you say, uh, what a crowded class. Okay. Uh, stating uh, during a thunderstorm, uh, and of course, you know, in, in, in the Western world, the rain and the storm is not pleasant, unlike um, probably in the Middle East, when there is rain, everybody is happy and feel it's a bless. Uh, so depending on the culture of the thing, some people consider the thunderstorm is a bless. So some people might think it's not uh, a bless. So this is your job to understand what the writer uh, wants to tell you. 
So if the writer is uh, talking, the most most of the poem is not uh, about uh, happy time, about happy moments, and so, and they tell you beautiful weather we are having. So you re you realize that the writer definitely is using it in irony. Uh, when an authority figure is stepping into the room saying, don't bother to stand up or do anything, especially, you know, when, when uh, in the, some cultures, when the boss comes in, he or she expects everybody to stop whatever they are doing and show a sign of respect. And when they come in, in nobody uh, bothers to do any, anything and, and he just, he or she, just says, don't bother to stand or do anything. So you understand that the person saying it in irony. The purpose here is to show irony. Uh, in when a comedian telling an unresponsive audience, uh, you are all a great crowd. And you know, the stand-up comedy shows if um, the stand-up comedy is happening during the week, <laughs> weekdays and when they start uh, throwing their jokes and nobody's laughing and uh, they start saying oh you're a great crowd you're a great audience definitely they are um, having it in irony because nobody's laughing and that would be absolutely the difference when they uh, present the same show on a weekend because the audience, when they come on a weekend, they uh, become ready to smile, ready to laugh, ready to have fun because it's weekend. You know what I mean? Definitely you've been there at a point or uh, the other. Now, when you are, for example, describing someone who says foolish things as a genius, and we are very uh, like, you know, um, I'm 100% you among your peers, among your friends, classmates, uh, relatives, like your cousins or your um, brothers, you, you know it. When somebody did something in a wrong way and you say, ah, I know you, you're very smart. Mashallah, you're great, you're this and that. So this is kind of uh, using the word in irony. You're being ironical, and this is uh, a, a, an acceptable way. It is not rude at all. It is acceptable way of trying to joke around. Uh, so do not take it as an offense or uh, consider it as offense as long as you are using good words, as long as you are uh, keen on choosing the diction. I'm, I'm, I'm using the term that you are going to use in poetry, what we call the diction. So when you come to analyzing a poem, you're going to say the diction of the poet uh, of the poem is so and so and so. The poet uses words so and so and so. So mainly you will be analyzing the choice of words. The last example here is delivering bad news by saying the good news is like, for example, uh, um, you know, something is canceled or something is, is whatever happens. So in that uh, concern, you might say uh, the good news is we are not going to have a raise in our salary. So or you can say the good news is the party is canceled because of COVID or because of uh, whatever. Remember those days, definitely you remember how many wonderful, pleasant things were canceled because of that. So uh, this is our lesson for today. Thank you so much for being uh, attentive.